Hare Krishna, everybody. This is the podcast known as The Soul Ashraya. I am your host, Dr. Jake. I am joined by another great devotee who is also a host. His name is <laughs> Balaram Shakti. Hare yes, Hare Krishna. So nice to see you. So nice to be here. Yes, we're going to have a good, good show. This podcast is about the Krishna book. We are going to be reading through the Krishna book, and we are going to be answering a lot of questions that might be pertinent to a new devotee. Balaram has some years in Krishna consciousness. I am somewhat new, and we wanted to tailor this podcast to help newcomers and new devotees with any answers and questions that they might have. So without any further ado, Balaram is going to lead us in our invocations, which we like to do first. Go ahead, Balaram. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Jnana Timirandasya Gyananjana Shavakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurve Namaha Namo Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanda Swamini Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirgashesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Vancha kalpa tarubhyas cha kripa sindhu bheva cha patitanam bhavane vyo haishnave vyo namo namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gidadhara Shri Vasadi Gauravakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Jai. Well, before we get right into the book, how was your day today? Day's been great. Uh, we had a nice program last night. We're doing uh, programs at our Mantra Oasis Center every Saturday night. And it was really, really wonderful. Uh, two really beautiful kirtans. Um, pretty cathartic for me personally. And uh, then a talk by His Grace Govinda Dot, who is a Prabhupada disciple in from Los Angeles for the week. And... Uh, Man, he's just such a pleasure to be around and associate with. Uh, he's he's a real example of a happy devotee. You know, someone that this um, process has truly worked for, you know, uh, successful. Uh, yeah. All the symptoms of a devotee. Yeah. Nice. Uh, yeah, and then... I found out last night that I was needed to give class this morning <laughs> in the temple. So I just pulled a few notes together uh, late last night and um, somehow or other, you know, was able to give a nice class by uh, my guru and Prabhupada's mercy. Um, Seems like seemed like a decent class so yeah nice. but yeah it, and that's really wonderful you know 
speaking on Srimad Bhagavatam, very purifying, ex- extraordinarily edifying uh, to be able to kind of churn all the things on your mind, you know, with um, scriptural intelligence, you know, spiritual intelligence, uh, and speak what our predecessors have spoken. Um, it, it's really, really amazing. So every other Sunday, usually I give class and it's always like a really big boost for me um, in my Christian consciousness. Yeah. So now that's in Tucson. Is there, um, do you want to give out any information about that, that um, maybe someone, someone out there is in the Tucson area, mm-hmm. maybe they would like to stop by the temple, is it? Is it? It's a temple, right? Yeah. 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 So every morning we have a morning program. Every ISKCON temple has a morning program that's basically uh, threefold. The first part of the program is Mangala Arti, uh, which is the most auspicious time of day for spiritual practice. And you get to take advantage of the spiritual practice of all the individuals in that temple and all the personalities that have, you know, great personalities that have been there in the past. Sure, the Prabhupada is personally present there. And the uh, current of all that of that spiritual advancement is there. And you know, when we practice devotional service together, we basically multiply our efforts because we're sharing the same object of meditation, right? It's not like having a personal sadhana, which is great. You know, you're leagues ahead of 99% of the world mm. um, just by doing that. But uh, you, know, you only have whatever you're able to muster on your own, which, you know, is, is limited in this age of Kali. Um, but going to the temple, you know, everyone, we're all meditating together, worshiping together. So it's like a worship service. And then we have Japa period. Uh, and it's great to be able to chant Japa in proximity with others in the temple room. Again, that's a spiritually charged atmosphere being within the walls of the temple or just on the premises. Some people like to walk around the temple, circumambulate. Uh, and some people like to go to their own space. They, they leave and go somewhere to chant Japa alone so they can really concentrate. Yeah. So, you know, to each their preference. But yeah, so we have an hour and a half to two hours. Usually each temple will have an allotted time for personal chanting of of their japa, the Hare Krishna mantra. Yeah. And then we come back together for another worship service, um, worship of the guru, appreciation of the spiritual master, uh, which the uh, Shastra says that, you know, one who has implicit faith in guru and Krishna, all of the imports of all scripture are automatically revealed to such person. And also Yasya Prasada, Bhagavad Prasada, that by pleasing the spiritual master who is so close to Krishna, it's like pleasing someone's son, you automatically please that person because the person considers their son like a part of them. So Krishna says that. He actually says, I consider the spiritual master not just a part of me, but me, myself. So by worship of them, you make great spiritual advancement. So you're putting your, you're investing your heart in the right place. You're investing your heart in someone else whose heart is totally occupied with Krishna. Yeah. So it's a way that Krishna manifests to us in the uh, material world. And another way is through Srimad Bhagavatam, which after that, um, Arti, then we, um, have a class on Srimad Bhagavatam. So that's generally at eight o'clock every morning at any ISKCON temple. You can walk right in, mm-hmm. sit down, listen to class, and then take breakfast, you know, free breakfast. Um, so that's a great opportunity for anyone who lives close to a temple. You don't, you know, the morning program is five o'clock here, the Mangal Arti. 
you know, a lot of people aren't able to get up early enough for that. Um, but they can make the latter half have nice prasadam breakfasts, start your day right. And I mean, just imagine if you did that every day, you know, there's no calculating the benefit that you get from that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And right. There's also online um, ISKCON Tucson Transcendental Media Network. It's a Facebook group. Oh, okay. That all the classes are posted. Yeah. So you can check them out there. Now, how would you describe Tucson as a city? Is it a spiritual place, would you say? Or is it more of a modern um, metropolis? Um, is it's definitely it not a metropolis. Okay. It, yeah, the downtown is just like a couple high rises. So it's not anything, you know, huge like that. It doesn't feel like a big city. It is big. Like apparently it's over twice as big as Rochester, which like blows my mind. Uh, Cause Rochester feels like a big city. You know, you go downtown. I mean, it's not like New York city, you know, but it's like, you know, um, but it's, yeah, I guess there's more people here. Uh, I'm not sure if that's like greater Tucson versus greater Rochester. I could be, I could be wrong, but uh, no, it seems like, you know, there's definitely something mystical about Southwest, you know, pretty much anywhere you go here um, with the exception of just, you know, rickety little towns. Uh, but yeah. I don't know if I would say spiritual. <laughs> There's nothing really spiritual about modern cities unless they have a temple there. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, um, I was going to just um, let uh, everyone know that, um, well, I, I don't, it may be a, a let everyone know kind of a thing. It may just be me talking about it but so um manjari dasi she does a uh japa walk every sunday morning at 9 30 and um you know maybe i can figure out how to share that information but so i do that on sundays she does it on fridays and on sundays at 9 30 in the morning she's in yes. india right now so um they have been very powerful the amount of information that she fits into an hour and a half is is dense it's very dense and i'll try to get you the link to that and uh i know that there's some other people that were wanting to check that out too so i did that this morning and uh wow, you talk about starting your day the right way. I mean, it's kind of late, you know, it's not like five o'clock in the morning, but you know, it's, it's nice to be able to get a little rest on the weekend. And it, to me, it's like the perfect time. So as a matter of fact, perfect segue. <laughs> so uh, yesterday we were talking about the, the Rasas, the Rasas, the Rasa in the Krishna book. Of course, what did she bring up today? <laughs> and she she did on her she's pretty active on the WhatsApp group, and um, she will post a lot of the um, a lot of what she talks about, like right on the WhatsApp group. So I'll try to get that information to over here to our WhatsApp if, if I can, you know or somehow get the information to everybody. But um, yeah, it was like the perfect, uh, it's so funny how when you start getting into this stuff that how meeting to meeting, you seem to always be talking about the same stuff all of a sudden, you know? It's like, it's just a, a crazy thing that happens, you know? You go to one meeting, 
and you start getting into something and then the next thing you go you, you go to the next meeting and you're talking about the same thing and it's like huh lord's trying to talk to you that's all so yeah were we talking about this yesterday because yeah. uh i was just recently talking to someone about how that invariably happens um the more that you do these practices and just do the things, do your regular sadhana, you know, read Bhagavad Gita, read Srimad Bhagavatam, chant your rounds, listen to whatever Krishna consciousness lectures. And even in the mundane world, sometimes this happens. You just like, you're in sync, right? And things just line up and information comes in you know basically the idea is if you're pointing your intention in the right direction then information and intel you could say will come in and to support that so what would speak if you're putting your intention in the highest possible way yeah. and that's literally krishna consciousness you know the highest reality is loving devotional service to krishna so if you're aligned with that and you're doing things in your day to plug in with that, Krishna says, um, Actually, that's not the verse I wanted to go with. Uh, no, 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 no. For one who is constantly engaged in my devotional service, Ananyas Chintiantamam, Yejana Paripasate. Those who worship me with exclusive, worship me, Krishna, with exclusive devotion, meditating on my transcendental form, to them I carry what they lack and I preserve what they have. Mm. So, you know, the things that you need, you know, I carry what they lack. It's like whatever you need, Krishna will provide. You know, he'll, he'll give you the intelligence. Uh, the Dami Buddhi Yogam Tom says elsewhere. Yeah. Uh, yeah, let's speak of any paraphernalia you need, you know, any anything you're you're lacking. So we should never worry. But yeah, it's always such an amazing experience when that happens. Uh, you know, that like the topics, and actually this is what happened. This is what you will experience in Bhagavatam classes that the Bhagavatam is actually Krishna. Also, it's another form of, it's the literary form of Krishna, just like the Maha Mantra is the sound form of Krishna. You know, the deity is the, the Archa Vigraha uh, form of Krishna and so on and so forth. You know, this material universe is itself a form of Krishna. You know, this, um, uh, you know, you can you can view the universe in a you know personal like human like way as you know this you know heavenly planets represent his head you know earthly planets represent his waist um, rivers represent his veins like so many different ways that the Bhagavatam self explores so it's another form of Krishna. Anyway, yeah, meditating on, on Bhagavatam, uh, which in that way, um, the topics of the, of the Bhagavatam classes, they have a way of churning out all of the just things in the ether uh, with the community, with the temple community, you know, mm -hmm. things that are current for you, right, issues that you're having. Right. The, generally, there's some collective conscious just stuff in the atmosphere and we're all dealing with it in individual facets and, you know, um, capacities, whatever our capacity is. But the capacity of Krishna is, you know, limitless. So he so this is the idea of the temple of a temple is you have you install the deity as the center point. Because the deity is, you know, is God. It's representing, it's, you know, Krishna is actually present there. 
Mm. And so the whole temple community is um, performing worship and all these different services. Everything is dovetailed in service of the Lord. Uh, and therefore, we're bringing all of our stuff, you know, all of our good stuff, all of our bad stuff. And the deities are actually working that out to purify you, to purify all of it. You know, you, you bring yourself to the temple. Krishna says, yeah, um, I, I will carry what you lack and I'll preserve what you have, you know, and, you know, I'll, I'll purify you. And yeah, you tell them I'm say that verse goes along with that. As you, as they surrender unto me, I reward them accordingly. So the more that you give yourself to the process, you know, hearing from Krishna, chanting Krishna's name, serving the temple, you can make your home a temple. The same thing will happen. If you're actually serious and sincere, then Krishna will purify your entire life, right? Everything in your life will become sublime, meaning you'll feel his presence and he'll be real in your worlds, in everything that you're doing and touching. He'll be there and you'll experience that. And beyond that, you know, you'll, you'll also enter into his worlds and experience, you know, his activities, his pleasure and so forth. Uh, yeah, so the the Bhagavatam classes in the temple, they, they always do that just invariably. You know, the more that we come together as a group and solidify our, you know, this one-pointed intention, right, intentional community, uh, single, single focus, that we're all trying to serve Krishna here, that links, you know, together. Um, all of the facets of, of, our, of our lives, actually. That's why it's so important to be connected with the temple community. You know, it's very important. And if you don't have one, you know, try to connect either virtually, uh, like, you know, we're doing here, we're connecting virtually, giving, expanding the network, you know, transcendental net media network. It's what they called their uh, Facebook page. So you can, you can link in and, and uh, if, if you can't live at a temple, make your home a temple. And by associating with devotees who know the art and science, I mean, you, you can uh, be successful in that. Yeah. That's, that's. Oh, you froze up a little bit, buddy. That's okay. Yeah, that's okay. We will, I love what he was saying about that. That is so great. But uh, we will probably um, do a little recap from the Krishna book of what we read yesterday, episode three um, on uh, April 6th or uh, May 6th. Hey, buddy. It's okay. I got you. It's okay. Okay. I kept it's okay. Good enough. Yeah. Seamless. <laughs> totally professional. Seamless. <laughs> so I was just talking about how we are going to uh, just uh, go over real quick what we read yesterday, and then we'll continue on today. So yesterday, we were still in the preface of the Krishna book. We were on um, XVI yesterday where Prabhupada was talking about the mellows or rasas and uh, the 12 loving relationships and um, in the ninth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita it talks about that a little bit and then um, about um, Basically, what you were just talking about, actually, like um, how uh, Western countries can, mm. you know, how if you do what you're supposed to be doing, you can channel um, the loving propensity towards Krishna and, and likewise he reciprocates. So, um, yeah, they can directly perceive the results. Yes. Doing yeah. that. Yes. Pratyaksha Vagamam Dharmyam. Actually mentioned that. I quoted that verse in class this morning. Oh. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, very, very important verse. Actually, it's the first verse I memorized in Gita's chapter nine, text two. Yeah, Raja Vidya Raja Yeah, now that? That, that is something that is, is um, important too. That's a whole new aspect of things that I wanted to get into too, because as you're talking, you can put up, you know, you can say all these verses are now is a verse from the Gita considered to be a shloka or is that something different? Is a shloka just a mantra? What's the difference there? Shloka is a verse. Okay, so it is a That's, verse. Yeah. Okay, nice. Okay. Yeah. So, so you've memorized some verses already, some good verses. Um, yeah. Now, what has that done for your mind being able to, yeah, I can see, I can tell. Go ahead, yeah. talk about it. Oh, man. Um, I don't know if I'm able to express or explain very well uh, I think someone that has memorized a lot more is more advanced on the path than me would have greater realization and well, obviously greater realization, but, you know, better reflection. Um, but I'll say this, uh, well, there's, there's a lot that it's so subtle because the, the language itself, the Sanskrit language, is has a purifying effect on the consciousness. So just chanting Sanskrit, it's like uh, the difference between someone who speaks, um, you know, redneck English or whatever you want to call it, or, you know, pigeon English, or even just, I mean, if you associate with people that speak you know, very, you know, what, what do you even call that? Um, there's a word for that. Uh, like, um, yeah, um, I can't even, like it's a uh, collo colloquial. Would you consider that to be? No, that, that's like common usage of terms. Yeah. Um, Just, you know, low grade English. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I'll go with that. So <laughs> I feel like you, know, you started, you started so hanging out with those people and yeah. actually this monk was mentioning this, how there was a monk in his temple in San Diego that left, went, lived with his family, stayed first with his family for like the holidays or something, came back and was like using swear words. Mm. And I was like, Hey man, like what happened? It's like, Oh yeah. You know, I was with my family and they talked like this a lot. And eventually, you know, he dropped that habit. But it's it's like it comes at you're associating, so you take the qualities and the habits as well. You know, it starts with just like subtle qualities, um, or you know, thinking, feeling, and willing is the are the three activities of the mind. So you associate with someone, thoughts are impressed on you. Um, then you start having feelings, like you start picking up on their moods. So if someone's angry, that that can affect you. And then willing, it's like eventually their habits become your habits and you start thinking and feeling and willing and acting the way that they do. Mm -hmm. So speech is an interesting thing, getting back to the topic in that people that speak like that, it's like it, everything about them just comes off as less intelligent. Whereas someone who speaks very eloquently, you know, that's that's a sign of higher intelligence just just the structure of the words and the grammar that they use right is is higher so sanskrit is the epitome of high lexicon you know high grade lexicon and it okay. the grammar it takes at least 13 years to of study of intense study full time to pick up the grammar to like master the grammar of Sanskrit. Right. Um, wow. You know, and it's not even including, you know, vocabulary or 
you know, because each word has so many so you know, layered meaning, deep layered meaning. So to string together a shloka in Sanskrit is no small feat. Um, so these great sages from bygone ages, they have given us so much of a treasure. And the more that you study Sanskrit, the more that you speak Sanskrit, the easier it is, the more that you like pick up, the more subtle that the, the, these shlokas enter your mind, you, you learn how, you know, you start appreciating anyway, how these sages are thinking. And so their thinking, feeling and willing starts airing you because this is how they talk. This is how self-realized souls talk. They speak in Sanskrit poetry, which is amazing. It's like, I mean, a close example of that mundane is, you know, when I was in Brazil, the Portuguese language is very poetic, you know, so to express something in Portuguese, your consciousness, like it can travel places. It can have these very rich experiences that if I were to just translate that poem or just that sentence, like a sentence is more, is kind of like a poem in, in Portuguese and English can be poetic as well, but the romantic languages are definitely much more. So, uh, you know, we can all agree on that. So it's like, it's like painting, you know, or like a dance with these multi-layered meaning of words. And so it does a lot more for you than just this kind of, you know, monot monotonous or whatever English, just, you know. Right. Um, so there's, so there's some pretty serious studying behind doing Sanskrit, learning Sanskrit, learning the verses. It's not just like, just go out and like start learning it. There's like, there's a well, lot. Well, no, you, I would, not necessarily. You can just go ahead and start learning them. Um, first is, you know, get your pronunciation right. Hmm. Uh, you listen, hear it, hear the verse properly um, spoken, chanted, and you'll pick up on it. It didn't take me long, um, which the person who first started reading with me, he was really surprised by how quickly I picked it up. Um, so, you know, there's some probably past life stuff, you know, the, and that's the thing, the more Sanskrit you're exposed to, like your subtle body gets those imprints you know, and you carry that with you. Uh, so even on a, just a gross, you know, material, you know, and then, you know, subtle mental levels, it's, it's clarifying. It's like listening to Mozart versus listening to you know Lil Wayne or something you know, like a, a, a baby or a, a fetus rather in the womb the, the music that's playing you know it it penetrates its you know ears as well and even before the ears are formed the vibration of the sound you know vibration is really everything yeah. you know that's actually the, kind of the main point of of talk of this topic um so the vibration of the environment, you know, be it music or be it, you know, if the parents are yelling at each other, that's like a harsh vibration that the child picks up on all those things. So the formation of that child's brain and nervous system responds to the sound. So they've done studies, you know, if you play Mozart, which is very high vibrational uh, and very, I don't know how to describe, you know, just the science of music. I'm not a musician, but I appreciate that that's what's going on. You know, any musician will be able to tell you that. Whereas if you play derogatory music, you know, it's like, what kind of child are you forming? Right. So actually our consciousness is always, always has some plasticity to it. Right. Always, you know, it's, it's always learning. Uh, so obviously the younger you are, the more that you have. So the better off you are, if you start reading and chanting and memorizing verses at a young age, because you're, you will be hardwired like that, yeah. you know. So, uh, must, but yeah, uh, just start, yeah, start chanting verses. And yeah. So the. the so the idea. But is, the other thing, oh well, before is uh, 
is just it gives you tools and really it's almost like it gives you weapons it gives you like sort of knowledge as Prabhupada would say mm. uh well as Krishna says you know the doubts that have arisen in your mind you should arm yourself with yoga and slash them with the you know sort of knowledge so they get instilled these little aphorisms sloka is like an aphorism um will be instilled you know just like any kind of mantra or affirmation you keep saying them because they will enter into your subconscious mind um and they'll help you to understand so like when i'm giving class or i'm speaking and i reference a verse verse is also called a sutra or not necessarily but um certain uh categories or genres of of literature are um, sutras and a sutra is known as the tip of a, a spool of thread right so the idea is if you, if you can find the tip you can unravel this package it's a dense package you know it's densely packed right spool it's got a lot of thread in there a lot of content but it's all bundled up in one thing but if you just find the tip of it you can unravel this whole um you know plethora of wisdom and each word each syllable you know it's like you can break down and so much wisdom is there and just by exploring the contents of that sloka that whole process of exploration of utilizing your intelligence that really solidifies a lot for you yeah. so that's kind of the purpose of hearing and chanting whenever someone is chanting a sloka you know, really listen attentively and try to follow yeah. Yeah. So the the vibrations that are in the Maha Mantra, that's all similar, or is it the exact same as reciting shlokas? Like, is it? It seems like it's all the same energy. It's actually something so much greater, because it's not. A mantra it's not a sloka it is in a sense but their names it's actually the personality of krishna is present in that sound vibration that is the sound form of krishna so they're not just sounds you know, like so this is yeah this is a wonderful point that chanting slokas like i said at the beginning of that chanting any kind of sanskrit is going to be positive It'll help bring you into the mode of goodness, just like listening to Mozart will bring you into the mode of goodness. But it doesn't necessarily change your heart. And that's the point of bhakti, is we're looking for a transformation of the heart. And getting into the mode of goodness is helpful for that, but that's not the end uh, or, you know, end all be all. Um, that's not going to transform your life in the actual sense the actual sense is we need to change our heart, you know, change our desires, our intentions, our motivation, the way that we see things, which, yeah, the way that we think about things and the way that our mind, you know, having a clear mind is helpful for that, you know, but it's like having a very precise tool, like a surgical instrument, but not having the knowledge of how to use it. It's like, you know, what's the use? You've got this very high tech piece of machinery with the human body. And you can bring it to a very elevated, clean state, you know, pristine condition, you know, mode of goodness, eating all organic, you know, listening to sattvic music, you know, being in nature, connecting with the earth. All these things is very mode of goodness, but in and of themselves, they don't change your heart. Associating with spiritual personalities is the only way to change your heart. You have to be. You have to be moved by a person that's real. Nothing else is actually real because it doesn't pertain to your relationships. You know, and you can say, no, it affects my relationships. It's like, okay, but when where the rubber meets the road, that's where the action and the magic really happens. And that's through our relationships. Yeah. You know, that is the heart of the science of, of all yoga and religion. So we associate with spiritual personalities and ultimately and most centrally, we cultivate our relationship with the Supreme Personality by 
um, mainly through chanting his name, which is not different from him. So it's like, is it Sanskrit? Uh, yeah, it uses the same script, but it's not a word in the dictionary. I mean, it could also be a word like Krishna also means black or blackish. So it's also a word, you know, but it's, uh, it's his name. So as vibrationally speaking, it's, yeah. there's a whole person there, you know, <laughs> it's right. not just like a piece of paper or something. Yeah. So mantras, because there's all kinds of mantras, mantras are normally usually more powerful because of their design. Like they're, they are designed to be more powerful. Is that, is that what you're saying? That's the. Yeah. Idea. These mantras, bona fide mantras were written by great sages thousands of years ago, you know, who were fully enlightened. I, you, I, I was probably generalizing here, but Srila Vyasadev, you know, is, he's the compiler of the Vedas. So he wrote, he wrote down, you know, the, the four Vedas and, you know, Mahabharata, fifth Veda, um, all the Puranas, uh, various other Vedic literatures that include mantras. Um, yeah, like the the Brahmana section of the Vedas of each each Veda has you know one section of mantras, another section of like explanations, further details, and then Upanishads, which are the aphorisms of the actual philosophical conclusions. Um, so the, those sections of mantras is where we get most of our mantras, and so those were compiled by someone whose mind is thoroughly purified you know thoroughly purified so it's like he's the best composer of literature that ever walked this earth you know it's, i mean i say that but it's you know there's also rupa goswami his literature is i would say the most genius uh, i mean i say that only because i've heard experts actual vedic scholars you know people have gotten their doctorates on this subject matter they say that rupa goswami is the most genius no it was he was 500 years ago and so he wrote you know bhakti rasamrita sindhu so many books uh but anyway the idea is the same like when we chant things that were written by these personalities like you know they've given you it's like if you go to you know honda for a motor you need a motor for something you, know, you want to go to a place a reputable you know authority yeah. who's expert so they're experts like english mantras then you know if, if that's kind of where you're going with that a lot of people chant mantras that are you know just regular english sentences like i am confident and strong and whatever you know um those can be helpful but Jake and it's help best. it's more helpful Jake if we know best. What's that? <laughs> Jake's the best. <laughs> Jake yes. is the best. <laughs> Go out there. And, you know, it's good. You know, we should have, you know, that motivation. And obviously, just chanting the Sanskrit, it'll act on a subtle way. But if you know the actual meaning and you're you're familiar with the meaning, that then you can actually kind of put your heart into it. And that's obviously right. more powerful. But, yeah. Wow. So Today's much there. short lesson on mantras. <laughs> Seriously, though. Very right? brief. There's a lot more to it. Oh, I'm sure there is. That's well, actually, and what's particularly um, relevant and helpful and good to know is that most all, if not all, mantra, Vedic mantras begin with the syllable Om, right? Hmm. Uh O M or A U M, right? The, the uh, that is actually a name of God. It's a way of addressing Krishna, and an impersonal. It's um, like a shorthand, and it was included in the Vedic mantras in order that those who utilize those mantras would get spiritual benefit. It would be a yoga for them 
even if it's unconscious, even if they're doing the mantras for a lower intention, their intention is impure. And this is the idea of Vedic, all the Vedic literature. It's meant to gradually awaken you to spiritual consciousness, but it's working, it's giving you tools no matter where you are on the ladder of consciousness, meaning what, like how pure is your intention? Like, are you just trying to gratify gross senses? Are you trying to gratify subtle senses? Are you trying to gain some kind of mystic, you know, experience? Or are you trying to serve God? No matter where you fall in there, the uh, Vedas will, will meet you where you're at and they'll give you a process uh, to utilize your, you know, propensities and purify yourself at the same time simply by chanting Om. Uh, because that that word or that syllable includes three letters which indicate the supreme uh mother supreme father and resonant um resonance of your individual soul the existence of your soul and that's everything that's that's god you could say that's god uh yeah so just by invoking God by saying Om, yeah, and in that way, any chanting any name of God, or even chanting like Lord have mercy, that adds up. It adds up, and eventually, I was just talking with my friend Nimai the other day. You know, all those little foxhole prayers they all um, accumulate until eventually one day. You know, maybe you hit rock bottom and boom, all of your devotional credit pours in as God's grace and he reveals himself to you and you say, oh my God, that it's been you this whole time. You've been there and you were in that name when I chanted, uh, you're just saying, God, like you're there. Even if my intention, that's the point, that's the point of bhakti. If you understand the science means no matter what your intention is, even if you're in those lower modes, if you simply chant Hare Krishna, you're bringing Krishna into your life. You know, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Wow, that is so good. That is so good. You know, I, um, I've always been a, a firm believer in prayer and, uh, and in, not only in prayer, but the power of prayer too. You know, that's really, that makes up a lot of my, my past life, if you will, is that, you know, mm. really learning about the power of prayer and, you know, um, and, and you are so correct in the words that we use and say on a daily basis really do affect the atmosphere. Like sound vibrations come from, what you speak out into the ether i mean even the bible talks about that and so what the, what comes out of your mouth is like what's going on in your brain so from what i have learned so far is that the word mantra comes from manas which means the mind so I think that you can change the atmosphere by what you're thinking. And I think this is a yogic principle is that you can change what you're thinking about will actually manifest basically without getting too out. And I don't want to get into like woo woo territory. If you want to call it that, like, you know, um, <clears throat> you know what I mean? You know, um, that kind of territory of like, you know, but but you can definitely make a tangible difference by what you're thinking, well, by what you're saying. Yeah, no, this is this is another very important thing for us to understand is this concept of mantra. Um, it's not, I mean, woo-woo, it's kind of just like, well, it's speculative. You know, it's pseudoscience. Mantra is factual science. You know, <laughs> this is all coming from the Vedas. The Vedas, there's a... You know, in the uh, the Sanskrit dictionary, um, which I forget the name of the Sanskrit dictionary, but it has actually sutra, like slokas, like a verse to explain every word. 
and it breaks each word down into its component syllables and letters and will explain what the word means because that you know sans again sanskrit is a perfect language right it's it's not something concocted like hey what do we call this big you know gray thing that's really hard and dense well let's call it rock we just impose a name no it's everything in sanskrit is what it is so again you know sound uh is is really everything everything has a sound vibration and so those who are kind of enlightened awakened they can directly perceive that so um it's uh manasa trayate iti mantra so it means man mantra means manas Triate, so mind and triate means to deliver or to project. So, and again, like each of those words you can break down, you know, into its meaning, etymology. So, mantra when you when you speak, you're projecting something, right? You're putting something out there into the ether, and don't think that just disappears because you can't see it. You know, you're seeing, you know, earth, water, fire, you know, fire anyway means that which is, has light, it's visual, you can see it. Whereas you have two more senses um, that is touch, you can't see the wind, but you can feel it. You know, the air moving, there's air element and then the ether element is what you pick up sound with. And so those are, those are whole you know, dimensions of our reality, you'd say. So, you, yeah, you project things, or mantra means to deliver, and that's if if you're not projecting sound vibration, but you're invoking sound vibration, right? You're calling in something higher, and that will have a purifying effect. It will, it will free you from your mind. So mantra in the proper context means to free the mind, or it's to, you know, free you from the mind. Uh, yeah. So when you're chanting the Maha Mantra, um, this for a newer person, um, this might be a, a bit of a stretch, but I'm going to say that for the time that I've been doing it, it makes a huge difference in your life. And I am trying, I guess, now that I've witnessed um, and know that it actually does make a difference in your life, now I'm trying to figure out why. <laughs> I guess that's where I'm at now, is I'm trying to figure out, I chant this mantra, and all of a sudden it's like smooth. It's like your life, and it's not perfect. It's never, mm. ever perfect, but things just fall into place i can attest to that um you know coming from a um a fundamentalist christian background and switching over to something like this it took some time and i want to be able to relate to people and not uh, scare them away i guess but if you just take the science of sound and what we're talking about and you apply it to what you listen to, what you speak out of your mouth, what you think about, you're, you're yeah. gonna have either a high vibration or a low vibration. And we can get in, I mean, it's so crazy that we got on this subject, <laughs> but it's an important subject. And um, I just wanna say that as a newer devotee, there's something to this Maha Mantra that I can attest to, that I can witness to, that I can tell you, yes, this does work. This does really work. And there is no woo-woo in the Maha Mantra. There's no woo-woo in that whatsoever. I, I can, that will be the takeaway for today, is that there is no woo-woo in the Maha Mantra. <laughs> yeah, it'll actually dispel anything woo-woo that's going on in your life. Yeah. It'll dispel it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the whole idea. We want to have a pure, clean, 
life. We want things to run smoothly in our life. Uh, so the first step is just introduce order to your life, which the mantra will do because your mind is given and is given a, uh, structured, uh, rhythmic object of meditation. And so the, whatever object of meditation you have that will enter into your psyche, right? So you want an object of meditation. You don't just want like something abstract, like meditate on nothingness. It's like, Unless you want to become nothing, you know, which is like, I don't recommend that. We yeah. usually call that suicide, right? Uh, you, you want to meditate on something that is harmonic. So the Maha Mantra, you just, you just look at it. There's, a, there's an incredible science of harmony in that. You know, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hari Rama, Hari Rama, Rama Rama, Hari Hari. Amazing. But again, there's personalities. You're not only are you bringing order, you're bringing the supreme divine order because you're calling the supreme Godhead to enter into your life. And he's created the whole universe. You know, <laughs> he's created mysteries in the smallest atom that you can never understand. You know, we were talking last night um, how the Bhagavad Gita defeats uh atheism right and um oh yeah it was like we're he asked the speaker asked us a question or he he posed this that he read an article of you know how the amount of the population of people who consider themselves religious has you know continues to decline and there are reasons given in the study that was done right and uh, there's some very interesting points in there, but the main one was, you know, show me proof, right? I just, I don't see it. And if, if there is God, why doesn't he intervene? You know, I don't see God, which we're not going to get into that um, problem of evil. Uh, yeah. But if you read Bhagavad Gita, you know, that law, all these things will become very clear, but it's like, who can put a tree into a little seed? You know, it's like, that's pretty amazing. And so the devotees and Srila Prabhupada, we would challenge these atheistic scientists, like you just make one egg. You, you know exactly what, what's in there. You know, you have all the chemicals, you know, the blueprint, you know, just make one egg that creates a life form. And it's all, oh, well, you know, that we can't do. So well, why not? In theory, you say that life comes from matter, but you can't produce life in a factory at any point. Will you ever be able to do that? Because life comes from life. Life and life comes from God. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it does. As a matter of fact, it does. No one, I think they got it down to like, they're trying to actually make cells, like one single cell, and they simply cannot make one single cell not in a lab nothing they try saying oh yeah we uh we uh made the cell and when you really really look at it they're like nah we just added some other stuff to it <laughs> you know <laughs> like it seems so like that's actually what we're trying to do with our life that's a micro you know right scale of what we're doing with our life we're trying, i have all the ingredients i know what a good life looks like on paper, you know, I get a good job. I get a married, this, this I have. Okay. Do the church thing. Okay. Now maybe I don't need the church. You know, I do all these things and putting all these ingredients together. It doesn't do it. It will never solve, you know, the knot in the heart. It just can't happen. It's because life comes from God. You need God in your life. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Okay. That's why we're here. That's why we're oh. doing this. Yeah. So um, we uh, did not get to uh, the book today. Um, it's okay. He'll he'll be back on in a second. The signal out there is not the best. But uh, yeah, okay. I got you, bud. I got you. I'm carrying it. Okay. I'm carrying on. Don't worry. <laughs> If you drop off, that's okay. It just gives me a second to talk a little bit. That's all, you know. So, yeah. 
No. Um, so what we want to do, that's a, that's a good freeze right there. I like that freeze. That's a very good freeze. <laughs> Screenshot that. <laughs> so we um, are at our time right now. Um, I would actually like to thank everyone for watching us and um, you know supporting us just simply by watching us. Like I had mentioned before, this is really- I turned off my Wi-Fi. I think that was the problem. Oh, okay, okay. I, I shouldn't have done that. Oh. Should have, should have known. Okay. Anyway, all right, let's, let's go ahead. Why don't you read? The Krishna conscious movement is a unique kid. <laughs> I, I, I was just saying that we're at our time, but we could go a little longer and I would like to. Do you, I mean, if, why don't we do that just for the sake of actually reading the book we're supposed know, to be reading? <laughs> I know. I want to read it. I feel bad. Because... No. Yeah. Yeah. That's that. Yeah. And then. Yeah. Yeah. It's, then we can wrap it up. Yeah. We, we have hit on very important subject matter. Let's, we do need to get this read today. So let's go ahead and do that. Do you want to start reading or do you want me to start reading? You know where we're at? You can go ahead. Yes. The Krishna consciousness movement is the unique, unique gift of Lord Chaitanya to the fallen souls of this age. It is very simple method, which has actually been carried out during the last four years in the Western countries. And there is no doubt that this movement can satisfy the dormant loving propensities of humanity. This book, Krishna, is another presentation to help the Krishna consciousness movement in the Western world. This transcendental work of literature is published with profuse illustrations, People love to read various kinds of fiction to spend their time and energy. Now this tendency can be directed to Krishna. The result will be the imperishable satisfaction of the soul, both individually and collectively. I'm just gonna keep on going. It is said in Bhagavad Gita that even a little effort expended on the path of Krishna consciousness can save one from the greatest danger. Hundreds of thousands of examples can be cited of people who have escaped the greatest dangers of life due to a sight advancement in Krishna consciousness. We therefore request everyone to take advantage of this great transcendental literary work. One will find that by reading one page after another, an immense treasure of knowledge in art, science, literature, philosophy, and religion will be revealed. And ultimately, by reading this one book, Krishna, love of Godhead will fructify. My grateful acknowledgement is due to Sriman George Harrison, now chanting Hare Krishna, for his liberal contribution of $19,000 to meet the entire cost of printing this volume. May Krishna bestow upon this nice boy further advancement in Krishna consciousness. At my I'll, end, do, I'll do the last one. Oh, okay, so there's yeah. a lot of names. Okay. Here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And my last, and at last, my ever willing blessings are bestowed upon Sriman Shyamasundar Das Adhikari. Sriman Brahmananda Das Brahmachari, Sriman Hayagriva Das Adhikari, Sriman Sat Swarup Das Adhikari, Srimati Devahuti Devi Dasi, Srimati Jadrani Devi Dasi, Sriman Murali Dara Das Brahmachari, Sriman Bharadraj Das Adhikari, and Sriman Prajumna Das Adhikari, etc., for their hard work, their hard labor, and different ways to make this publication a great success. Hare Krishna, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, Advent Day of Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasvati, February 26, 1970, kind of Headquarters, Los Angeles. So um, 
yeah, that first paragraph there was kind of um, hearkening or echoing um, rather what we're talking about, like different music. You know, people like to, it's the same thing. People like to read various kinds of fiction, various literatures. You know, we're attracted to these different uh, vibrations, right? It's basically what it is. Um, different types of music. People like these different different modes of thinking and feeling. Right? And then thinking, feeling, and willing. Those are the activities of the mind. So, uh, you know, that that will pull you in different directions in your life. Um, so, and, but it's also, you know, getting into the idea kind of related to what we were talking about yesterday of various type, kinds of fictions, like various types of drama, right? We, we're all attracted to dramas because we want and we need the rasa. We're all looking for rasa that, that exchange those, those emotions that get pulled out through dramatic, um, you know, relationships. That's, you know, that's that subtle, um, swargia rasa. Um, and of course, you know, the gross, just physical taste as well is also there, but really we need something that stimulates our mind and our emotions. And so we, we look to dramas to do that. And, uh, Anyway, this book, Krishna, is like the ultimate drama. We'll find in these pages that every variety of humor, you know, or mellow of dramas, you know, comedy, humor, I'm sorry, comedy, action, adventure, drama, romance, um, tragedy, you know, all of the emotion, they're all there, but they're there in superlative you know, in, in their fullness. Um, and again, you know, I mean, this is, this is God's story. Like he's writing the script here. So it's the same thing. If you bring God into your life, more order will come in, you know, divine order. Um, ultimately, uh, that all of, all of what we were speaking on, uh, that's what Prabhupada is, is basically, uh, saying here that if you simply direct these tendencies to, Krishna or subject matter, you know, of Krishna, that which is related with Krishna, the result will be the imperishable satisfaction of the soul, not just satisfaction, but again, you know, you're painting the portrait, you know, you're, you're discovering the portrait of the soul, you know, that tapestry of eternity it, that never dies, never goes anywhere. So not only is reading and hearing transcendental you know or like sanskrit or this you know um poetic literature you know good for you and orderly and you know har harmonious it will it will have that effect but it's also spiritual and so it, it gives the fruit of eternal life yeah um, which is amazing powerful Yes. Well, so we've officially made it through the preface. So um, I guess the next episode of our podcast, we will start on the introduction, page one. So we'll, we'll plan on doing that uh, this coming Saturday. I'll put in the link and all the uh, information that we need about that in the WhatsApp group. And um, again, Balaram, I am like eternally grateful. Thank you for your time and for your wisdom and for being able to do this show. It's, uh, it's really quite a blessing to have you. It really is. And um, thank you. And thank you for engaging me. This is yeah, real blessing for me equally. And um, thank all the uh, devotees in Tucson when you see them and, and um Tell them that I say hello and pranam and everything. And maybe we will see them this coming Saturday. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess we can close out with uh, saying the Maha Mantra three times and, uh, and that'll be it. Yeah.
अच्छा हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे Yes, all glories to Shiva Prabhupada. Jai. Jai. Yes. All right, Prabhu, have a wonderful week. All right, you too. We'll catch you next time. Adibo. Adibo.